Hello everyone, hello friends, hello new friends. Welcome back to Courageous Leadership with Virginia Pradhan, mm. which airs every Wednesday and Saturday at 10 o'clock on Edify, uh, Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, and many other platforms. Of course, you can watch it on YouTube channel. I am your host, Virginia Pradhan. I'm glad you are here because you love to be trained to live a life of significance and success in Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for sending us your questions, your concerns, your comments, and uh, ways that you need to be trained. And we love for you to be here. Mm -hmm. In fact, for those of you who are new to uh, our podcast, we want to tell you that you as listeners, you are the ones who created mm -hmm. this podcast. Mm -hmm. Many of you, after you read my memoir, Saving My Assassin, which is uh, pub was published by Tyndale House Publisher and talks about my life uh, in Romania under communist and socialist defended human and religious rights, and whereby the grace of God, he helped me to be alive, even though I fought against a cruel dictator. He wants me to encourage people now to stand up and be strong and courageous when the world around us is crazy and many, many people turn their back to God. Yeah. But also, we love our podcast because we enrich our podcast by invited courageous leaders who have done amazing job in their own life and are ready to share with us how they started, how they work, how God works in their lives and in the lives of people around them, uh, what kind of obstacles they encountered, how God helped them. So today you have a, you, you'll enjoy our, um, our guest, which is uh, Don Schenk. He is the tied director of the uh, tied ministry, uh, which is an outreach worldwide ministry. <clears throat> thank you so very much, Don, for coming to our podcast. Well, thank you, Virginia. It's a thrill to be here. And Quite frankly, I just love any time I get to talk about building God's kingdom, sharing his word. Um, you know, when I'm in public, some people, they're intimidated to talk about faith issues. And one of the first things I often ask somebody when I meet them is, are you a believer? Because I, I want to set the the tone and the to know, am I speaking to someone who identifies with the same faith as me? Or am I speaking to somebody who doesn't? Um, but I'm thrilled to be able to talk about, as I said, building God's kingdom, sharing what Jesus has done for the world. And to do that, for me, uh, let, let me go back in, in history a little bit. Uh, I want to share for you who are joining us on the podcast, who the Tide Ministry is and a little bit of who I am and how those two came together. Uh, the Tide Ministry started in 1946. And I, I was not around in 1946. I'm not the founder. But it started when Chambersburg, Pennsylvania was getting their first radio station. And Charlie Byers was a minister. And some of his parishioners encouraged him to go on air and preach the gospel. And so there, I think that was for, for a young man. He was a very young man at that time. That was a very courageous step for him, a bold step. He went on the air. And God used that. He would go Sunday mornings and preach live on the air, then go to his church and preach again. That program began to expand regionally here in North America. Eventually, when Transworld Radio began broadcasting in other parts of the world, Charlie was invited to put his program on there. And there were some countries which were former British colonies where English was widely understood. But it soon became apparent that the impact was better when people were hearing the gospel in their own language. And so in the 80s, the ministry began to transition and began to work with indigenous ministers in other parts of the world to help them develop, put together 
a media program. It was radio for many years. I use media now because we are doing some television and video. But to put that media program together and to utilize it to make disciples among their own people. And so it's somebody who is sharing the gospel out of their own heart, in their own language, in the cultural uh, cultural context of their own people. And it's, it's a very, very effective means of sharing the gospel. Where I come into that is um, I was a very shy, backward child born in Africa. My parents were missionaries and God called me and my wife into missions. And, and we served in missions for 13 years in Zimbabwe, Africa. And then God called me to leave. That. I felt him sensing that I, you know, I'm done with you there. And uh, I didn't know where he was taking me. I came back to the U.S. I didn't have a job lined up. Really no idea where God wanted me to serve, but still having a passion in my heart to share the gospel. And I found out about this opening. A friend of mine told me that the director at that time of Gospel Tide Hour, which is what the Tide Ministry used to be called, was, that the, the director was retiring. And he thought that might be a good fit for me. And so I did submit my resume, interviewed, and here, 22 years later, here I am continuing to serve with the ministry. And I praise God because it allows me to continue to be involved in reaching out around the world to share the gospel. And where we currently are, let me just, you know, if somebody wanted to see the whole broad back, uh, aspect and learn more, they could go to the tide.org and see in a little more detail what the Tide ministry does. But we're currently in over 20 countries on three continents doing 22 languages. And again, people say, well, how do you translate all those? The answer is we don't. We work with what we call boots on the ground. And Virginia, if you ask me, some of the people that we are working it with in other countries, they're the true courageous leaders. Because, you know, I sit here in my office in the U.S. I do the administration. I help with the fundraising. I help coordinate and awareness and help get people here involved in sharing the gospel in other parts of the world. But these are people, some of them are living in countries where they are putting their lives on the line to share the gospel. And it, it's inspiring to me. It's also sometimes convicting because I've been to places like Kosovo where there are listeners who are ostracized because they become Christian. I've been to India. I've met the widow of a man who was beheaded for preaching the gospel. And so there is, there's a lot of persecution around the world, but the gospel gets into people's hearts. And I don't know how to explain it to a non-believer until they experience who Jesus is and experience I, God. I think, you, I think you're right about this because each one of us, we have a place and a role and as long as we do our part, the others will be encouraged and do their part. And it, it's so interesting to me that you grow up in a family. Uh, you're born outside of the United States, but you're mm -hmm. born into a Christian family. Yes. I was born in a socialist communist country and... Uh, my parents were not allowed by the government to share the gospel in the house. Mm. So, uh, but still in God's power, right. he helped me to uh, understand him. He was patient to guide me through life and to appoint me to something that I never imagined to defend Christian and human rights cases under socialist and communist. So I will say for people that are doubting about what is my role or hearing you or me all the time saying, I heard God's calling. Yes, it is real. God yeah. is real and he guides us. Mm -hmm. The problem is that you have to listen and you have to be obedient and follow. He's going to train you. He's going to open doors for you. 
but he is faithful and he will do absolutely amazing things. You might not know today what, how uh, your action will reach. You're talking about the fact that you spend uh, lots of time in uh, Zimbabwe, Africa. It's impossible when I said that those words not to remember. Uh, that I have three children, uh, and when we came to the United States, we came empty-handed, no knowing English, no anything, no friends, and my girls learn English faster than uh, myself. I learn English. I went to law school, and my girls went to um, SMU, like me, law school, the first daughter. My mm -hmm. second daughter went to Harvard Law School, and my son to Air Force Academy, because with God, you can rebuild your life. But when I think about Zimbabwe, I, when I came to United States of America, I never thought that this little girl, 10 years old, one day will go to Harvard Law School and in Harvard Law School, he, mm -hmm. she will go um, in Zimbabwe, uh, South Africa and other countries and will help. Uh, people there and the government write constitution and include human rights and, and you know, uh, women's rights and so forth. So don't be discouraged. Just mm -hmm. listen right. to what God wants to do and be obedient to um, to his his uh, um, mm -hmm. his voice. And if you don't have anyone in in your in your family or in your neighborhood that shared the gospel, go to a church, read, uh, open the Bible and read. God speaks to you, will speak to you. And I would add on top of that, Virginia, for people not to get um, frustrated or impatient with God. I, when I graduated from Messiah University, I, at that point, wanted to go back to Zimbabwe just to live there. My wife wanted nothing to do with that. She was happy living here in the U.S. Uh, we went to visit and she came back. She said, if I could take all my family, all my friends over there, I wouldn't mind living there. And after I graduated, I worked in a number of different jobs. I worked construction. I worked business management. And I was always asking God, God, why, why can't I find something where I'm settling down? And when I finally had a job, where I was called in and said, you know, would you mind moving to Virginia for management training? I went home from that and my wife came, met me at the door and said, we can go to Zimbabwe now, but we're not going for you to be a farmer. We have to go as missionaries. And so the call for us to go came actually through my wife. But then as I, when I got to Zimbabwe and the things that I was asked to do, I realized God had been preparing me all these jobs where I thought I couldn't keep a job and I just kept moving here and there. Each one gave me a skill that helped me minister in Zimbabwe. So, um, you, nailed I, it, you nailed it there. And I want to stop here to encourage people because you said something so important. When I train people, sometimes some of them are so discouraged because they jump from one uh, job to another and they feel that they cannot keep a job. And you gave them the best example of God's training for a better job. Yeah. So don't be discouraged. You will see God's hands. Do what God is asking you to do. Thanks for sharing with us that. Yeah. And, yeah, I will go on to say, I'll give an example of our one of our radio pastors in Albania. You know, when, when we met him, we went to visit Albania. We heard from some people this was a former uh, atheist nation, and now it was open. Could we come help set up a media ministry there? And we met with different pastors, and one that really impressed us was a very young man. And one of the things he said was, I, I don't know if I can talk on the radio. And we encouraged him. We helped give him some resources and some training. I had a pastor here in the U.S. who said, here's some outlines from sermons that he can help work off of and help him know how to put a sermon together. And through that, he has become an avid church planter where he will uh, meet with listeners. And in Albania, they, they meet in coffee shops a lot and they talk. And then he'll get small groups and start a house church 
and then plant a congregation. And he's even now taking mission trips into neighboring Montenegro where his broadcast reaches and there are Albanian speakers there. So again, a story of someone who didn't feel really qualified, but accepted the challenge and God is using him mightily. And that's, that's really what we want to see through the Tide ministry is to see individuals like that being enabled to take what God's done in their hearts and share it with their people. It's very common. It's very common. I met so many people that I train and when when I speak, many people will say, but I don't have anything. Somehow, as human, we believe that or we expect that God will give us the blueprint. No, Mm -hmm. God is asking us for for faith. Mm -hmm. Do the step and I will provide for you. Uh, You know, I am a lawyer. And I am so many times impressed that the God of the universe makes negotiation with us, makes Mm -hmm. contracts with us, like he puts us on the same level as him. And he said, you do this step, fate, and I will do this. And and he's. I went to two law schools, one in America and one in Romania. Okay. And I love education, and my <laughs> kids went to good education. Yeah. But the education that God is providing for you through Bible, to the Holy Spirit, walking with Him, it's absolutely amazing. And you don't need the blueprint. You don't need, you need the obedience. You need to believe. And even when you don't understand, you need to pray and say, Lord, I don't understand, but I follow you. Help me joyfully to follow you. Mm -hmm. And others, others will see that and will see that there is a real sovereign, good God that you serve and they will want to know your God. Yeah. And I would add, Don't be intimidated by those who don't believe and who may ridicule you, um, who will, well, the persecution goes from simply being teased and ridiculed to, as I said, being martyred. But Jesus said there would be people opposed to us. Yes. But he also promised his presence is with us. He'll give us the words to say. And uh, when I contrast what's happening in American culture, this message is so important for believers to stand up and stand firm in their faith and not just to stand in their faith, but to declare it. Because we are we're heading in a place where I've said this many times, Virginia, the world looks at America and says we're a Christian nation. I don't like the world to look at America as a Christian nation. And some people will be offended by that. But the reason I say that is because what the world is seeing in America today is not Christian. And let, let me let me give you something. I think you 100% right. But let me encourage based on my experience and the persecution. Mm-hmm. America, in many ways, individual, as an individual and as a nation, we turn our back to God in many ways. Mm-hmm. We, uh, we want to be our own God. We want to have our own values. We Absolutely. change the meaning of family. We change the meaning of being a woman or a man that God created. And the list goes on and on. Um, in many ways, we think that persecution will, will come. Mm-hmm. But the beauty, and my sounds crazy that I'm saying the beauty, the beauty is that in this craziness world, in this world where people mock you or persecute mm-hmm. you <clears throat> and threaten you to lose your job, you need to close your mouth, don't say anything about your Christ or anything, Standing up for Christ, remaining faithful to him, gives us the best opportunity that we ever had 
as Christians in America to shine for him. Mm-hmm. And in this, under those circumstances, when people will see us faithful, they will see that there is a real God and they will want to follow our God. The Absolutely. other thing that I want to I wanna mention is this, and I try whatever I go and I train pastors and leaders and uh, college students, we have to understand the culture is trying to teach us that we are enemies against each other. Mm-hmm. No, we are not enemies. Not even the ones who mocks us or who is maybe even violent because we are Christians. We mm. have only one enemy, and that is the evil one. In fact, the evil is the enemy of Christ, but because we are Christ's children, he attacks us. Mm-hmm. The people yeah. that mock us and are even violent are nothing else but slaves in the evil stand. And Christ wants to use us to shine his love, his forgiveness, his sovereignty in us so he can bring them to to the cross and make them children of God. That's the best job that we can ever have. And we should not complain. Because God is is full of love and saying, come back to me, if my people. But we still don't want, or a majority of people in America still don't want. But it's not, I don't want people to be scared. I want them to understand that even under persecution, God is with us and he will do amazing things if we obey him. And I, I praise God for what I would call the the foundation, the remnant, the faithful, because, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm being critical of believers in America because there is a strong body in America. But there's also, as I said, the enemy has a strong presence. Yes. And and we've been assured the victory. And so we can't be, as you were talking, uh, you know, we can't be intimidated. We can't be ashamed or afraid. Let's stand firm. And again, I I think time again of some of the people I've met in countries where I've visited. And they are so inspiring. Let me give you an example. I don't know if you read my book, Saving My Assassin. And I want the the audience to be encouraged of this, is um, that we don't have enemies. Every person that we meet, Christ died for them. The reason my book is called Saving My Assassin is because after the government put me under house arrest and arrested and did all kind of crazy things to stop me to uh, defend Christians because I exposed the the government to, uh, to the entire world, the government sent a client to my office. Mm-hmm. And um, when he came, I have microphones and everything. So government, the government knew about my whereabouts. So he came after after um, uh, working hours. My assistant just introduced him, and she left. The minute that he heard my assistant closing the door, he pulled his jacket, took his gun, and pointed to my face and said, I'm here to kill you. I am not your client. And by killing you and doing this assignment for uh, our president, I will be number one in his rank. And he was so joyful. And you can imagine, he was 6'10 with a gun in my face. I was under 5 feet tall, 82 pounds, no way to escape. I was so fearful and I thought, I'm going to die. But in all this, I heard the Lord saying, share the gospel. And I did share the gospel with him. And to make the story short, he accepted Christ right there. And the story doesn't end there. Years after I came to America, I learned English. I went to law school. I opened my law firm. One day, he came to my office. I didn't recognize him after so many years. He mm-hmm. had a case, and he, uh, he explained the case. He said, Virginia, don't you recognize me? And he showed me his Securitate ID. I thought that I live again that minute. And he shared with me what God is doing in his life, and I shared with him that 
I am writing my book. And he asked me to let him write a chapter in my book. And today, when you read my book, Saving My Assassin, you will read his chapter and what God is doing in his life. That's our God. There is no, we do not have enemies. God can change even the most ferocious person that fights against us into a brother and sister in Christ. And if we have this attitude in America, we can change, we can allow God change through us people in America and people will turn to God. Absolutely. And, you know, Virginia, I don't have time to share the stories on this podcast, but, you know, I can tell you others like that, who people who were ready to persecute someone. And like one quick example, we do give radios out in India to poor villages where they don't have something. And in one village, we heard that the the local priest, uh, the Hindu priest, was threatening to smash that radio. But he'd come close every time and he would listen. And he eventually, instead of threatening, became a believer. And, you know, there's all kinds of stories like that. And I would encourage, you know, I do want people to stand firm in their faith. I also want people to help Christian ministries to share the gospel in other parts of the world because there is so much poverty and they need our help, the resources. That is so good. I hope that people will go to your website, will look and see what is going on, pray about and see how God wants to to use them for Mm -hmm. his glory. Uh, Don, I want to thank you so very much for coming to our podcast, for everything that you are doing for God's kingdom and for his children. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. Thank you again. Thank you, Virginia, for the opportunities. We are we are partners in the gospel. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Thank you so very much. Yeah, I, indeed, like Don said, we are partners in in the sharing the gospel. And I want to thank you for coming back to our podcast, Courageous Leadership with Virginia Pradhan. You can find um, all our podcast at virginiapradhanbooks.com. You can contact us. You can ask questions. You can buy the book. You can invite us to speak. You can receive training. We are happy to do this. I hope that you will listen at our podcast at uh, Spotify, Podbean, Edify, Apple Podcast, and watch it on uh, YouTube channel. Don't forget to go to Don Shank's uh, website. And don't forget, uh, if you need to listen again, take notes, go back to his, uh, his website, do it and see how God wants to use you for his glory and for others, his children all over the world. We thank you so much again, and we hope to see you soon. Until next time, God bless you. Bye-bye.